Hello everyone, this is Good Friday. Now you may be, you may be wondering, uh, why are there white pyramids on the altar and a white banner if it's Good Friday? Well, during this COVID, this whole COVID-19 thing that we're going through, we don't have all of the volunteers just coming and going through the building like we do during a normal period. Uh, the worship committee, they have to limit their how many times they come into the building just like I do. We just can't be coming and going all the time. And so that gives us a very small window of opportunity which to do anything, let alone put up the right liturgical colors. And of course, in Holy Week, you have a shift um, of three different liturgical colors within a matter of a few days. So they decided to put up the Easter ones, and we talked about that. And, and so that's what we went with. And we'll just have to, you know, during a time like this, we have to be willing to learn with, to learn to live with some ambiguities and some limitations. If there's anything, I, I really hope that as a society, we've also learned to accept limitations and we've learned to recognize limitations within ourselves that, uh, guess what, you know, things don't always go perfectly all the time. But the important thing is, is that we observe Good Friday as it's meant to be observed. Remember last Sunday on Palm Sunday when I said that that very first Palm Sunday with the hosannas and the palm leaves, that it was one rally with two causes? You know, it was the crowds of people really kind of gathered as a political rally because they wanted a change in government. And it was also Jesus coming because he wanted to announce that his kingdom was not of this world. He wanted as a Messiah, he wanted to reconcile, first of all, the human heart to the God who created it. So, you know, Palm Sunday was one rally with two things going on. Well, it's the same with Good Friday. Good Friday was one death with two different purposes. When Jesus died on the cross, there were actually two mutually exclusive things going on at the same time. Two different purposes, two different agendas. The first of those is the obvious. That's what we've already stated. To the crowds of people, the crucifixion was essentially about getting rid of a guy that they had considered did not meet the criteria to be the Messiah. He couldn't possibly be the Messiah because he wasn't doing what they were expecting the Messiah to do, namely kick out the Romans. As far as the religious leaders were concerned, they were all too happy to get rid of Jesus. They never liked him in the first place. He was a threat to them. He was a threat to the religious establishment. So the religious leaders were getting rid of someone that was certainly unwanted. And then as far as the Romans were concerned, they were getting rid of a rabble rouser. The Romans liked things to be nice, because they you know they ruled the place. They wanted things to be nice and quiet and calm and you know don't don't ruffle any feathers, don't stir the waters. And they saw Jesus as a rabble rouser, so they were getting rid of one. We know Pontius Pilate really didn't want to have Jesus crucified. Pilate knew that he was innocent. Pilate's wife knew that he was innocent. She went to her husband and said, Don't do it. Have nothing to do with him. But because the crowds of people were shall we just say hot-headed, and Pilate knew that he might have, might have a riot on, a, on his hands. He washed his hands of the whole thing, literally, and still handed Jesus over to be crucified. So the crucifixion of Jesus on one side, one thing that was going on, just in terms of purely social and political circumstances, it was a death row execution. That's all it was. But there was something else happening, too, at the same time. In the midst of all of this, God, God the Father, had a scheme up his sleeve. Now, you will remember that it was an ancient Jewish custom. It was a practice in, in, in Judaism at the time to have a lamb, to have animal sacrifices, particularly a lamb sacrifice. You know, that was what was going on with the pigeon salesmen and the money changers in the temple, they were providing for the sale of animals so people could do the sacrifices. 
But once a year, one, once a year, they would take a lamb. It would be a perfect lamb. It would have to be without blemish, without spot. I don't know how they determined perfection, but it would have to be a perfect lamb. That lamb would be sacrificed on an altar. And the blood from that lamb, God would accept, God the Father would accept as the sacrifice, an acceptable sacrifice for the sins of the people, and that would, that would cancel out their debt for another year. Don't ask me how that works, because I really don't know myself, not having grown up, grown up with that. I don't know exactly. I just know in Hebrews chapter 9, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And I've heard many people say, well, that's terrible. I don't like that. I know. I'm not crazy about it either. Just deal with it, okay? Because that's, that was ancient Judaism. They did, they did lamb sacrifices. But now, now we're at Calvary. And God the Father looks down on his son and he sees perfect, sinless, pure, spotless, unblemished Jesus. And God takes that moment, that moment, and Jesus becomes the sacrificial lamb that God provides that will atone for the sins of all the people of all of the world for all time, forever. Remember, remember uh, when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, John, who was actually his cousin, John the Baptist, was, was baptizing people. And when, when Jesus showed up at the Jordan River to be baptized, remember what John said? John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I think many of us have heard that. I know you, you've heard that hundreds and hundreds of times, especially every year during, during Advent. And, at, on a, and then, of course, the baptism of Christ Sunday. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Many people who have been going to church all their lives have heard that, and it never really dawned on them what it means. But what it means is that quite literally, Jesus is the lamb that God provided. The perfect, unblemished lamb that God would see him on the cross and take your sins and mine and put them on his son. You know, our sins were actually atoned for on a cross 2,000 years ago, just outside of Jerusalem. That took the place of lamb sacrifices once and for all. We don't have to do that anymore because Jesus is the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the whole world. If you would like to follow along, I'm going to ask that we read a couple of verses together. We'll finish it this way today. This is in Colossians. Colossians is in the New Testament. It's Yes, it's towards the kind of towards the end of the New Testament, but it really falls in the middle of the epistles. And we're in Colossians chapter 2. For those of you who have your Bibles open, Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to read just two verses here. Verses 13 and 14. It says this, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The record of debt that stood against us, it was forgiven us because he set it aside. He nailed it to the cross. Jesus paid for your sins and mine when he died on Calvary's cross. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. 
to the authorities and to the crowds of people. They thought they were just getting rid of someone who shouldn't be there. But God, God took a situation that was intended for evil. God has done this a lot before, actually. God took a situation that was intended for evil and turned it around and used it for good, for your good and for my good and for the whole, for the whole world. Because God the Son, Jesus the Christ, tasted death on our behalf. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, your sins and mine and everyone else's. May we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we can't even begin to imagine what you experienced from the cross six hours, one Friday. But today we remember it. We remember that you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And we know that you did for us what we cannot do for ourselves. May we never forget it. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.